and here there comes Lisa, who I've not met. <laughs> she was just here 10 days ago. Hey, Miss Morosky. <laughs> You're already. Hi. Hey, how you be? Good. It looks so strange to see you on camera, not in the room. <laughs> 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 that yellow wall behind you, I know it well. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know great. the wall behind you well, too. Yes, exactly. <laughs> no, I was just talking with Mark. Mark, where are you located? Uh, Colorado. Oh, all right. Uh, on the front range, yeah. Marco, the, the host, and okay. I live about 20 miles apart. Oh, all uh, right. And, yeah, we meet up every now and again and you know have a few beers and <laughs> solve the problems of the world not <laughs> <laughs> well it depends on how you spell not <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh yeah i know that yeah i checked that out and and lisa i watched the the this program with you I, I don't know, a month, six weeks ago or something. But I just uh, I just recently joined and started to participate. But I did see the two-hour Cosmos Cafe about language that you were talking about. So I'm Great. familiar with I'm familiar with 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 your work and, and I was just telling Lynn Claire that I was just brushing up or not brushing up introducing myself to her work. So now I feel like I got a handle on you ladies. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big handle, Mark. <laughs> I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. Yeah. So, so Mark, are you also familiar with the work of Gabe Sir, Jean Gabe Sir? Just through through uh this process here i haven't read the book but just watching the the cosmos cafe and the and the dialogue between the people and we had a, a i'm most familiar with wilbur i've read his his some of his books and 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 he's he's a colorado one sort of originally from Illinois, but I guess he, you know, his integral institute, which Marco was uh, involved with for a while. So I'm pretty familiar with Wilbur's philosophy and thus Gebser. And last, last two weeks ago, we had a discussion about Gebster, Steiner and Wilbur. Someone wrote a paper comparing and contrasting or integral theories and how it all sort of interrelated. Yeah, I, I mention it because the um, uh, the Jean Gabser Society is having its annual conference in October in Boulder. So I would invite you to come. Oh, are you going to be there? I'm going to be there. My my boyfriend is uh, helping to organize it. Uh, so I guess I'm like, the marketing department. <laughs> I, I guess so. Well, maybe maybe I will. October is... Uh, Coming faster than we want but to think. <laughs> still a long way off. Uh, so what do you but, do, Mark? What yeah. do I do? Well, I'm retired, but I am I write. I retired read. Retired from I, what? I'm curious what you, you're retired from. My last position was a uh, creative writing teacher at the uh, community college right here where I live. Fantastic. And I, I resigned that position about three years ago. I've, I've written two novels. I'm working on a third book, experimental, part fiction, part not fiction. Uh, it's on the past election the 2016 presidential election uh i've owned a bookstore i've worked in the you mental the health science fiction election <laughs> what's that you mean the election that feels like science fiction and makes me happy i'm seven thousand miles away <laughs> uh yes that one 
that one. <laughs> that, that one that blew everybody's mind, that one. Uh, I've worked in the mental health field, uh, owned a bookstore, worked in the restaurant industry, traveled a lot. So fortunately, I need to turn I've, on I've made it. Like, oh, she's, she's leaving. No, she can uh, still hear you. Oh. Uh, <laughs> one of the things she said that I really liked was, let's see, uh, our presence today means we didn't fail. I've said that for a long time, but I'd, I'd take it to the individual level in that every person, unless they're suffering tremendously, and even in that instance, if you're alive, that means to some degree you've been successful. That's correct. Mm -hmm. I well, like that. We, you know, we're here, we're present. That means we didn't flunk, we didn't fail. And that's why I look at, you know, past, present, pending. And past is with an ED on the end, not a T. Because the T is like the cross that most people have to hang themselves on. It's victimhood. <laughs> and come on, get over our story. It's time to, it's time to fold that cross back up into a, the cup that it is and drink from it. Good. People are showing up. Mindful AI. Marco, actually. Hi, Marco. Hi. That's what, that's my pal. Um, all right. I'm Lynn Claire. Nice to meet you, Lynn Claire. Nice Hello, to meet Lisa. you. Hey, Marco. Hi, Ed. Hi, Mark. Hi, guys. Who's Hello, in that? Hi. Acronon? Yeah, Ed. Hi, Ed. Hi. Nice to meet you. Pleasure is mine, believe me. Thank you. I will take the liberty of renaming ourselves so that we can work together. <laughs> so, <laughs> Not by so our we... Twitter handles. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's a great idea. Perfect. Thank you. How many are joining us tonight? Do you have any idea, Marco, or Ed, or who's, whoever's in charge? Ed, I've seen your face on a number of the videos. Yeah, uh, it shows up every once in a while. That is true. <laughs> <laughs> but who's in yeah. charge? That's a good question. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm waiting for the answer for that one, Marco. I like it. <laughs> well, I do think John will be joining us. Uh, if I, I think he'll show up. He, he'll be fashionably up. late. <laughs> and perhaps Jeffrey. Uh, yeah. There Speaking we go. The devil. Hey, John Davis. Greetings, Lynn Claire. How so are you? Great. So good to see you. It's great to be here. It's been a long day, but it's a good day. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> We're still having, you know, Europe is getting 80s and 90s all around the country. And the Costa del Sol, Lisa, would you believe it's still sweater weather? It's cold here. Yeah, it's yeah. It's been raining for weeks. Yeah, it's pretty, it's been cold here too. Has it? In New York, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not snowing to be right cold. now in Colorado. Not, really? Mm -hmm. Wow, it's not supposed to be cold in Spain, southern Spain this time of year. Yeah, uh, it's not supposed to be warm in Germany, but it is. So, oh, yeah, exactly. so there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, half of our team lives in Northern Europe and, and the UK. It was just blistering hot over the yes. weekend. So, wow. anyway, I'm happy to be where I am. So, I was just with Lynn Flair in Spain, um, gosh, just over a week ago. <laughs> And uh, and then in Malta, and I have to say Malta was a very interesting place. If you've not been there, it's it's worth a trip just to see the extremely extremely old temples that are on that island. It's a yeah. four ancient temple sites. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
And when Lisa was here, I don't, she probably hasn't mentioned it, but there's a connection with this area with Malta as well. In the, James, you all know James Cameron, of course, of Titanic fame, mm. Avatar. Um, he joined up with an American archaeologist by the name of Freund, who's out of Connecticut, I believe, University of, of Hartford. And um, they have discovered without, they've got the evidence is in, the verdict is in from NASA and from underwater. They've discovered Atlantis right in my backyard. Whoa. Yeah. It's, and there's a documentary. It's if you Google James Cameron National uh, Geographic and the name of the film, the documentary is Atlantis Rising and it's out outrageous i've seen it about five times <laughs> but and i've been i've actually been on the site and lisa can tell you it's it's a headbanger it really is <laughs> to go on the site and just be aware because just like the temples in malta you can be on the land and you can still feel the resonance it's still there it's very very powerful never dull right mm, no okay so okay guys i'm here <laughs> it's early for all of you. It's late for me. <laughs> I think that well, means. What do you want to talk about? <laughs> no, 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 no. I didn't. I I showed up to answer questions. No, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm talking to them. To, oh, to no. us, us. What What do we want to um, discuss with you? Well, I read in uh, the material on the Marian Matrix that there's some instructions there about beginnings and finding beginnings. So perhaps there's something that we could enact right from the beginning uh, to initiate ourselves into the conversation. When you say beginnings, can you be a little bit more specific? <laughs> well, <laughs> 33 pages and you know, every breath is a new beginning. So if you can uh, <laughs> be a well, little more specific, what would you really like to know? Well, what brings us all here together, here and now? It's a calling. I just answered. I said yes. But, uh, I said, uh, we were talking before you all got here, and, and I said I was going to be quiet, mostly listen, but... <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, but... You know, I got I to gotta be, be me. Uh, yes, you do. <laughs> Uh, Lynn Clare, I question I have, like I, like Marco, I was looking at at the little YouTube videos you put together, and and I was I've I've been doing this sort of thing for a long time, like fifty some years. Uh, so my question is how and and i one of the videos was a meditation and and how, how is and maybe we'll find out in october but how is your process your program is it how is it different from others that i've participated in and maybe uh, and you just said that something that triggered this maybe it's a a uh maybe it's timing that you have to be ready for whatever it is uh that you know whatever comes along and and you have to be ready to receive whatever it is the process but if you could start with you know the meditation and the music and the, you know, the relaxation, how's that different? Sure. Um, it's very different. Let me, you know, nothing in my life, absolutely nothing in my life prepared me to be doing what I'm doing. And dying three times really does change your life. But what I, I made a promise to come back. To, to, to remember what I experienced when I died. I was very fortunate um, to spend two years in the Dalai Lama's monastery 
on the Big Island of Hawaii, invited to live there. And His Holiness came, I spent time with Comfort Rinpoche, and when His Holiness came, at the end of two years, I'd been there just exactly two years, he brought the oracle. If any of you are familiar with Tibetan Buddhism, there's the Dalai Lama's spiritual advisor is called the Nechang Medium. Uh, his name is Guntinla. And um, the one thing he told me, um, I spent five days with him, and um, I didn't know until the last day that he was getting ready to throw me out and send me into the world. But he told me two things that have remained. Um, he told me many things. He took all my original art. He took, it was, I have nothing from those original days because it's all in their hands. But he told me to stay out of other people's stuff, to not look at, to know what I know, to, to feel what I feel, to hear what I hear, to smell what I smell, and to go to the world of science, not to prove I'm right, but to, to have them disprove what I've brought back. Well, to stay out of other people's stuff is a big task because people are always asking me, have you heard of this person? Do you know about this person? What about this? How are you different? And I've been very fortunate that other people have done those comparisons because I don't know <laughs> how it's different. All I know is what I know, but your question is so valid, Mark. So our new book that comes out in a few weeks, thank goodness it's all done, signed, sealed and delivered, um, the, the chapter opens with Dr. Bob Gray. You may have seen some of his work. All the geometry um, has been mapped and modeled the dynamics by Bob Gray. And Bob opens the new book with a whole, with a new chapter that no one has ever seen before that compares what I've been doing for the last 31, God bless of years, <laughs> with Buckminster Fuller. And I'm sure that if any of you are into geometry, structure, system, dynamics, you know Bucky Fuller, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so everyone's aware of Bucky Fuller. Yeah. So just hearing um, Lisa and you were talking a few moments ago about a comparison between Gebser, Ken Wilber's work, and I can't remember who the third, the third Niner. person was. I don't know. <clears throat> so anyway, the easiest way to describe what I've been doing is to share... Uh, the education project that I started 15 years ago because it takes the, the thing about this matrix is it's absolutely complex is the new book is Neville Wolf, Dr. Nick Wolf from NASA Astrobiology. We wrote a chapter literally on the beginning on the big bang. So Marcos, that kind of goes back to the astrophysics, astrobiology point of a beginning for your question. Then you to Brenda McNair took over and she's got a 200 page section in the book that literally, I don't know if you know that evolution is the most vicious and nasty <laughs> academic field probably going. There's three schools of thought and they kill each other, stab each other in the back all the time. And she took these three schools of thought and laid them all out. It took her almost two years to do this. And then she realized that they were all looking at the same thing from what? A different perspective. And so one was looking at input, one was looking at throughput, and one was looking at output. And by input, throughput, output, think of how you breathe. You inhale, you utilize the breath, and you exhale. That's how simple input, throughput, output is. So in 2001 we achieved what was a huge um, awareness, and that was we understood how all the fundamental forms, uh, Mother Nature's building blocks, fit into this matrix. It's not how they work, but it's how they fit. It's understanding how much belongs to that system and where it fits in a dynamic process. So in 2003, I began to look at if we have this knowledge and I was given the job to be a catalyst for change, to bring forth, hold, and honor remembrance, to bring to conscious awareness the realms, realities, and remnants in order that the spirit might remember the dance, 
easiest place to begin was with children because Mark, it's like that timing element, you know, we've got 50, 60 plus years of experience. And the one thing we're most resistant to is change. But I'm looking at a whole generation now of kids that are standing up, they're speaking up. And the worst thing that could happen to this current new generation is that the movement, the grassroots movement, which I think has the potential to be a grassroots fire, which you can never extinguish, the challenge that they face is, and that we can help them with, is that it doesn't turn into another Occupy. Because what we have with this matrix is an understanding, not of the why. We don't have your answer. That's not, that's not what this work is about. But we have the how. Most of us need to know or find our why. why that's why I'm curious why I asked you, what are you doing? What, would, what, was your, what did you do before you retired on the front plains of the mountains there? Okay? Whether it's the bookstore, being a therapist, working in the restaurant industry, whatever it is, what fueled that creative juice, the passion that kept you going? That's what interests me. And that's what grabs the kids. So I looked at this matrix, and what we discovered is the platonic solids, which I've got all these wonderful little models of four. Lisa can tell you she's been here. And magic happens when you put these seven fundamental forms on a table and people walk into the room because people are going to walk into the room and they're going to pick one up and they are going to go, this is me. This is who I am. It's really kind of crazy. And, but what it is, it's that creativity. It's the childlike quality and an adult that comes out and it comes at them out of the blue. They can't even explain it. So I said, okay, if we're looking at a whole system dynamic, what's the system where I can have an impact where this, how will be meaningful. I was just watching David Latterman on um, interview Malala, the young woman from Pakistan. Have any of you seen that? Yeah. Oh, it's really good. This Netflix, David Latterman, the series that he's doing is wonderful. His interview with Barack, Barack Obama was great. And Malala, I'm watching it for the second time. Her passion for education and young women is just right where my heart is. 15 years ago, actually, my goodness, it's 15 years. Is that right? It just doesn't. How is it possible that it's 15 years? I can't believe it. I said, I started looking at education. And I said, if this model is a template for education, for how to organize a classroom so kids can self-organize, what would I do? Well, the first thing that became obvious to me is we have coherence in this system by 33, numbers of 33. The context of the system, which is like a bubble, the core is like a diamond, unites all of these, all the polyhedra in singles and clusters for the first time. So we've united all of the polyhedra, not once, not twice, but three different ways in two di three different forms in this system. So I said, I designed a program called Team Playground. And it was an education model that was literally a classroom management protocol. Have any of you all been teachers? Yep. No. Okay. Hold on, I need to get rid of a, come on. I've got a, I had a flag on my screen. So, the challenge in education today, and it doesn't matter what age you're dealing with, I've got a professor from Penn State arriving here in a couple of weeks. We met at a conference in, um, in Budapest in, in last August. The problem in education is not academics. It's not reading, writing, and arithmetic. The problem is all 100% in the social dimension. It's the bullying. It's the inability to have healthy functional relationships. Teachers are spending 90% of their day, 90% teaching or dealing with uh, classroom management issues, conflict resolution. That means they're only spending 10% of their day with 83% of the kids with classrooms. 
So I designed a program that turns the social dimension over to the inmates. Let the kids learn to deal with the social dimensions in the learning environment. And I designed, I used the matrix, every form informs a function. This is a tetrahedron. Do all, any of you know about these forms? This is all on the website. You can see this right there. It shows how many are there, where they're there. Doesn't talk about scaling on the website. Then there's an octahedron, then there's a cube. But from the, the system, this is a very interesting piece because my voice, I'm speaking to you. And the amazing thing, it still boggles my mind that I'm speaking into a microphone. It's traveling over thousands of miles of wire where it's being converted into analog and then rechanged back into my voice so you can hear me on the other end. And that's happening because of phonons, which are elements of sound and elements of sound that turn into light. And a phonon and a photon, guess what? This is their architecture. If you want to understand why a phonon, what a phonon or a photon or any spin one half particle is, it's this. It's the smallest element. It's the smallest thing that can fit into this matrix. And only 10 can come in at, one, at, at a time. It's like there's 10 doors that open. There's actually 20, but only 10 open at one time. And I said, okay, we're going to assign this form. We're going to call them sparklers. We're going to call them whatever we want, but we wound up calling them bringers because they bring energy into the system. Okay? So these are the bringers. Does anyone know what you get when you have two of these? Have any of you seen the tar tetrahed star tetrahedron or the Merkaba? Mm -hmm. That's how two of these, if you have one fits within the other, well, what they actually are defining is a cube, okay? So 10 bringers come to school and they bring something with them. Most of you probably did show and tell at school, right? So we connect it to the senses. They bring something to school, but when they get to the door, they brought it, but it's not theirs. They don't own it. It's not mine. There's no possessiveness about it because they have to hand it off to a gatekeeper. And these are five kids, because remember two of these equals one of these, so 10 of these equals five of these. They hand it off to the gatekeeper who's responsible to put it in the physical space. So this, the order is coming from sound or light into, does anyone know what the cube is the structure for? If you go back to Plato or science, <laughs> I do, but I'm going to hold off. Okay. Well, if you, does anybody have a crystal sitting on their desk? Can someone pick up a crystal? Great, John. You mean like this? Totally cool. Find a vertex and it will have a threefold because all crystals are cubic structures. They're going to be hexagonal. So you'll have a vertex of three that will branch out into to look like this the perspective that i'm trying to hold this in the camera uh, cool okay? okay so that means that implicit in there are these other structures so sound and light came together to make that crystal that's in your hand now it's solid in your hand i mean you're sitting there holding it on your hand but you know that you're vibrating so at the quantum level it's vibrating it's resonating with this structure because so, we're looking at sequence because these are things, but we're not looking at a thing. We're only defining how everything fits. That's why we say divine architecture and the art of becoming human is what this is all about. So there's five gatekeepers who are responsible for the physical environment. Now, so you take in a breath, it enters your body, do you feel your system expand or contract when you inhale? It's a paradox. You actually feel a contraction. You actually feel a contraction. Everything gets drawn in or is it pushed in? Let me ask you that. Is it drawn in or pushed in or is it both? 
<laughs> it's all about paradox all the way down. So what it gets, what happens is you have five of these that define a cluster of these. Now, this is a dynamic that Bucky was aware of, and it's called a jitterbug. Now, Bucky wasn't aware of the process that I'm talking to you about. As a matter of fact, his grandson, Jamie Schneider, saw my work many years ago and just started crying when he saw it because he said, this is what my grandfather was looking for. And I don't know if you know that Bucky uh, attempted suicide and had a near-death experience and came back, and that's became what his whole life became about. So this is a very important cluster of kids in the classroom. And Lisa and I were having lunch last Saturday with a young woman. She's a professor in one of the schools locally. And she saw this and she told us afterwards, she just wanted to reach over and grab it because she said, that's who I am. And you know what this is all about? It's about water. And these are what we call the wave tamers in the classroom because that compression, you know, when something something goes wrong, think water, think your emotional body. So if this is your physical body, and this little thing is all your passion, all the sparks of energy that light you up, this is your emotional body. So what happens if you take in something bad, it makes your body sick, what does it do to your emotional body? Can you see the relationship? Are you yeah. feeling a sense of flow for, for where I'm going with this? Yes. Mark, yep. Making sense? Okay. So if this is, if we have a cell and it takes in energy and we bring that energy in, what's that force called? If I drop my Kleenex, what happens? There's a force that pulls that down. It's called gravity. Bravo. What's the opposite <laughs> of gravity? Yeah, I thought, yeah. Cool. But it's also what's the opposite of gravity? So if this is the system, if this is energy coming into the system, it's entering the door, it's compressing, gravity is pulling it into a minimum state, then it has to expand to a maximum state. Now these models, what you'll notice about these models is every edge is the same length, okay? Because we're showing a vertex relationship between things here. So this, if you have five of these, again, remember I said this is not what, what it is, this is just what fits. This actually expands to about three times this size because it's a growing system. So whenever there's been a crunch, and the wave tamers have had to deal with the emotional consequences in the room. What happens? Well, let me ask you a question. What happens to your heart, your emotions, your relationships when you lose your sense of humor? Mark, you're shaking your head. What well, happens to your sense of humor? Well, it gets, it gets pretty uh, ugly. It gets pretty ugly. You do yeah. creative writing. What happens if in a creative writing situation, if you just have, it gets tense and tense and tense and tense, and there's no lifting up. There's no lightening up. I saw a Goldie Hawn movie many years ago. Go to the liquor cabinet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that throws you, if you can't lighten up, that causes you to deal with your emotional, your emotional body collapses. And that's where addiction and all other kinds of stuff happens. And what happens to the physical body when the emotional body collapses? It collapses. It collapses and all your passion, all your fire for life, your energy goes out. Oh, shit. Okay. So if you're taking in good stuff and your body, your physical body, I mean, the skin you're in is your biggest organ. It's your sensory organ. You know, this is your skin. It holds everything together. If you don't have skin, you're not going to, you know, my brother was burned when he was like 11 years old. And they took skin grafts off my shoulders and legs. I suffered more than he did because his nerves were all killed. Mine were not. So I went through more pain 
because he needed skin to live. Think about it. Your skin, the skin you live in is, is what holds you all together, literally. It's not your brain and it's not even your heart. Your skin is responsible for your experience. It lets you feel your emotions and it lets you lighten up. So what's responsible for lightening up? Were any of you guys class clowns? I know you weren't, Lisa. <laughs> you were? <laughs> How come I'm not surprised? <laughs> Someone's always got to lighten things up. And it's really the most important thing we can do. Now, we're all responsible for the energy that we take in. Every one of us has a physical body. We all so far as the evidence of a heart, <laughs> as the evidence of a brain. This is neuroscience. This is where the neuroscience comes in. This is where our attitudes get set. This, the job of this function inside the system that we call the Marian matrix, we call this the light lifter for obvious reasons. These are five kids, they have a job. Their job is either to tell a joke whenever there's been an emotional crunch, they call a timeout from the teacher. And by the way, these kids never ask for permission to do their job. They just get up and do their job when they have to, except when they have to interrupt the teacher because they need to lighten up. There's been, there's been an emotional crunch. So they tell a joke, they do jumping jacks, they do a massage circle, they do anything that lightens the energy in the room. So going back to, we take in energy, all my little honey tools here, we take in energy, it comes into our body, we feel our way through it. You know what the brain is really good for? Connecting the dots. Closing the door, saying enough is enough. Because the fastest way to disconnect the dots, one of the biggest ways to disconnect the dots has to do with this stuff. This is called many, this is a euro. <laughs> What happens to your brain if you don't have enough money? If your whole life experience destabilizes. What happens if you're, you financially destabilize? What happens to your emotional body? What happens to your physical body? What happens to your access, your ability to access energy? So in this matrix, what this matrix is showing us is when enough is enough. Doesn't matter if it's an attitude, money, bullshit, or crap that someone's throwing at you. When is enough enough? You either can connect the dots or you cannot. So if someone offers you, I had a young man here, Lisa knows this story, a young man who was offered cocaine. Talked to me, came to me with his dad to talk about it. offered cocaine. Very wise young man. He knew it was bad for his physical body. He said no immediately. He didn't have to think about the emotions. He didn't have to think about how he'd pay for it. He said no. Not good for my health. So what if what you want to take in is good for your body? You can lighten it up. It feels good for your heart. Well, then this big guy comes into play. This is, there's only one of these in the whole system. You may recognize it. Plato said, this is the structure of the universe. That, this is what they use this form to represent. It's called a dodecahedron. This, Lisa and I, we had a dinner last week, or lunch rather, and this one guy, Fernando, came in. He's a banker. I mean, think, just think left brain, left brain banker, who just got drop kicked into the right side of his brain. It's like, this disconnected his language center. And he went, this is who I am. <laughs> this is me. <laughs> and in every way it is, because in a system, this is the piece of you who has to know it all. This is the piece of you who has to take, once you connect all the dots, what do you get if you have a map with numbers and you connect the dots in the right way? What do you get? A picture. A wow, picture. Oh, Marco, you're so smart. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. You get a picture. And once you have the big picture, you can move. And the minute the system moves, we had fun spinning these things because once they spin, you, you see circles. You don't see geometry. You don't see any straight lines at all. 
So once you've all seen the knot, the cover on our book, it's on the very front page of the website, the Marion Trefoil. It's, it's also the one on the, the Cosmos Cafe page. Uh -huh. for oh, good. I didn't see that. Yeah. Perfect. So anyway, that knot literally connects this entire system. And it puts everything from, this is, if you get the big picture and you get the go, then you start to grow. Because there's virtually no time in the process that we've talked about getting from here to here to the emotions and to the brain. It happens in no time. What we're talking about is doing it consciously, consciously using this as a decision-making process. So in this, this is where the flow begins and everything begins to be get rearranged. We talk about priorities using this. I just realized if I'm going to turn that off, that would maybe turn off some glare. Um, what happens to you guys when someone breaks a promise to you? How do you feel? Upset. Upset. Betrayed. Betrayed. Betrayed, yeah. Marco, how do you feel when someone breaks a promise to you? Violated. Yeah. Not fun. Mm -hmm. And how do you feel when someone wants you to compromise? Depends. Say again? It depends. It depends. Mm -hmm. I love that answer. It's perfect. Do you know why? Because it's the next step from this. Because if someone breaks a promise, it's very different from someone coming to you with a condition and saying, I'm sorry. Something beyond my control has happened, and I need to compromise. I need to either make a new deal, but it's beyond my control. So when we go from promises to compromise based on issues of time, time and timing. In this system, time and timing is where you can negotiate. Because here's where you're setting priorities you're making and keeping promises. Everything is in the flow. All the energy is moving towards a new outcome. So the next structure, and I'm sorry, I don't have a, a model for it here. You can see it on the website. This is where the Kepler solids come in. No one's ever been able to dynamically unite other than throwing them into a paper bag. <laughs> the platonic solids, but when it comes to mother nature's building blocks, there's two more solids that are fundamental, and they're called the Kepler solids. And they're rhombics. They have one is based on the square root of two, the other is based on the square root of five. So the next one that fits in the system in this dynamic process, because we're stepping through it like a, it's sort of like stopping a Swiss watch. You're able to stop it and see what's happening as one gear shifts and hands off to another gear. So from the dodecahedron, the next rotation and twist takes you to a shared vertex, a three, four vertex, which is input and throughput. It's like the place still between, you're still processing that breath. And we call it time and timing. And Mark, when we were talking before everybody else joined us, we were talking about time, big time, which I call divine time and human timing. And I look at the past, the present, and the pending, the future is the pending. And they're all right here, right now. But I don't spell past with a T, I spell, spell it with an ED. I didn't flunk, I didn't fail, I passed. I'm alive and in this moment. So we call these kids time shifters and this is the only multitasking they do in the classroom. And the multitasking is so simple. It's not even really multitasking. It's where there's a this and there's a that. So five kids have the job of passing out a paper and picking up a paper, writing on the board, cleaning the board, opening a window, closing a window, um, anything where there's a this and a that. And it's very exciting when you see these kids picking up these different roles and coming up with different responsibilities, tasks that they can do. 
So the time and timing is, is it's all about remembering. Okay. Because what happens, go ahead, please, John. Yeah, I, I'm um, a little overwhelmed. This is fascinating, though, and I intuit some of it. And I've, re I've read the article, um, but a lot of it's over my head because I'm mathematically phobic, you know? Um, but I, but there, was, there's, there was a moment in high school where for like one semester, I really got geometry. And it just made a lot of sense. Um, logic. It's yeah. only logic, it's not numbers. But what, what, what grabbed me about this article is you, 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 break, you go through nine to one, I believe. And uh, I think there's a, a fascination between numbers are quantities, but they also have qualities as well. And I think they, there's an imaginal area that I think mathematicians who are trained to use uh, these uh, symbols uh, are very concrete for them. And that's what I'm getting from you as well. I get it from Kaufman, I get it from you as well in, in this demonstration. Um, I just wanted to, there's something that you said, if you, mind, if you don't mind me just pursuing this a little bit. Uh, you said, um, while most people would say they have five senses, humans actually have 10 senses. Five are experienced internally and five are detected externally. Now that makes a lot of sense to me uh, as I'm a lucid dreamer and I've had a lot of visionary episodes and a, a lot of psychic experience. And, I, and I'm fascinated by what your education program seems to be um, in engaging children to use their imaginations in healthy ways. As most of us, my education was definitely uh, based on the factory model. And um, a lot of my, I think, intelligence was insulted by that, my educational process. <clears throat> I'm, st I'm still in recovery. So... What, what, but one of the things that seems to be a presupposition was that there was an outside, out there, an external world that was objective, and there's an inner world inside that's private and subjective. And it seems to me that uh, your near-death experience and um, your capacity to remember and bring back information that uh, has made these uh, models, uh, enriched our world with these models. I think that is a, is a big challenge as many of us may have had uh, experiences that don't fit into this inside outside split. Um, that um, we have to somehow, once we have these experiences, it's often they're very baffling and can even be disturbing and sometimes they emerge out of trauma um, as in their death experience. There seems to be, uh, a growing emerging need for people to put into words these experiences and to make them shareable. And I think that's what the, the transition that I think you've, you've been going through. And, um, and many of us here uh, on the cafe have been trying to put into words these anomalous kind of experiences. So I wonder if there's anything in that you could elaborate on and that, um, that I've, I, I don't know what the question is. I hope there is a question in there somewhere. <laughs> let me, let me just, let me, I want to, I want to explain there's, there's only two roles left. And so I just want to explain the last two forms because they're important. Okay. Because there's Thank only, you. There's only eight steps here. It's really very simple. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt, well, but I, I got perfect timing. It really is because it lets us negotiate and move forward in a very clear and direct way. Okay. Because Thank you. Step, the next form, John, that we're going to step from with time and timing, which remember I said it's eternity and the present moment, which takes us into our next breath, because there's no such thing as now. That's the great illusion. The minute I said now, it was gone. It's history. It's ancient history. So the minute we step, continually step into time, what the next thing that we encounter is this core of authenticity, which is the piece of us that most people want to ignore, deny, or throw away. And it's the aspect of our spirit. It's the aspect of the all of me that's about to encounter the outside world. It's that inner authenticity that only you can authorize. You are, it's up to you. This is your life, what you do, what you say. This is where you take that lucid dreaming, that awakening sense of self and spirit and your all the moral values, that 
inner, I call it enlightenment, that empowerment. You take it in time, in spiritos, and you take it out into the world. That's the unveiling. That's where you become like the child, the ambassador from the classroom to the school. You become an an ambassador what you carry because you can be walking down the street and you can see people on the other side of the street and they see you and there's that momentary exchange and you feel it you know it it's there you meet people and you know it's in the moment one of the things i want to share with you about this form is so important is this little thing remember i said this is energy it's the simplest three-dimensional form. And why is it so important? It has an inside and it has an outside. Now, when this goes, what goes into the system, guess what? Only what's on the inside gets inside of us. Because what we take in, everything that's on the outside is scraped off. The good stuff is on the inside. And so how often do we look at something out there and we say, oh, look at that and look at that. What are we judging it on? What are we being judged on? We're being judged on what's on the outside. And they don't ever take it in to see what's on the inside. Mark was saying, you know, I've been on this spiritual path for 50 years. It's like, I'm sorry. There's lots of newbies out there. There's lots of new kids waking up. There's children. There's babies. This is, this is time for the elders to step forward and say, hey, guess what? We don't have your answer, but we know the questions to ask. And guess what? We know. We know the order to ask them. If you're talking about an individual you start with the little things first. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. But if you're talking about, that's, that's local. It goes from local to the inner input and then out into the world. But you can't start there with the world. You have to start with the individual. But if you're going to talk to two people, you better start with the global. Why are we here? It's not about a me. We're all me's, but it's all about why are we here together in this room, in this space tonight. What's the mission? What's the mandate? What's the niche that needs to be fulfilled? What are people hungry for? What are people, what are people thirsty for? What do they want? The answer to that is only found in the spiritual. It's where morality and ethics, where nobility of spirit comes into play. And that's where we have to stop and say, What's our vision? What are our values? Who are we in this moment? Then what's the next question? Who are, are we the right people in the right place at the right time to do what we think we can do? If we're the right people in the right place at the right time, and we all say, this is our vision, here's what we want to do, and it's spiritual. But it better be physical, too. We better bring it down to earth, earthly good. So then the next question is, what do we do first? Remember I talked about priorities and promises. Can we make a priority and promise? Those of you who were in business, Mark, you were in business. You ran a bookstore involved in restaurants. Going back one step to are we the right people in the right place at the right time? That's all about risk. It's all about quality management and control, isn't it? I have a question for you. How many of you have ever tried to manage your time? the most bogus piece of bullshit advice anyone will ever give you because the bottom line is time is managing you whether you like it or not. So take your passion, go back to flash dance and make it happen. And then it becomes timeless and it becomes seamless and magic happens and the universe cooperates. So when you get your priorities right, you get a banker in the room and you know how to stabilize it. You need to close the door and it's what you did so brilliantly a few minutes ago, John. You just said, enough. And Lisa can tell you I had a banker sitting at my table. Lisa, how many hours were they here? Like four? Yeah, four. We, we never left the dining room table. And he went, 
oh my God, I feel like I'm in university. And this, this poor guy, this banker he started with, Lisa can tell you, the first thing I said to him, we're talking Spanish style. You have to know that in Spain, lunch is lunch, business happens after lunch, and it's all getting to know you kind of time over lunch. And there's always wine on the table, and it's, it's Spain, for goodness sake. So we were talking, and we were talking about all kinds of things, and and. I slipped a statement in about taking health being your number one concern. And if you don't take care of yourself, you can't be there for anybody else. This guy, Mark Snips Fernando, he pushed back his chair and he almost stood up. I thought he was going to leave. And he said, you're breaking the family. Because I was telling him self-care is the most important thing he can do for his children and his wife. and. He went on for a long time. Well, by the end of lunch, by the end of lunch, he was going, he was talking about how he wished his grandfather was alive to see it because his grandfather's advice, his grandfather's wisdom was for, for relationship was to ignore it. Just, just ignore it. Do what you want to do and ignore it. And his new assessment was this is making the family which is what I said um, once we, we got through it. And he said, this is the new wisdom for the future generations. Because once we know how to stabilize it, then the emotions, the communication, the feeling, the transparency flows, and then you can build it. And then you know where the energy is that you can bring it back in. So what this model does is it lets us look at me, me first, as paradoxical and Burger King as it sounds, you know, unless you're whole, you're going to always be bankrupt in relationships and your heart's always going to be broken. You're always going to be half empty because we always wind up expecting someone else to fix us. And, and, and an expectation, I was just writing about this today, it's just a cold-blooded grudge. And it's, it's murderous. And it's premeditated resentment. So if, if we are whole and healthy by ourselves and we know how much to take in and we're taking care of our physical bodies and we're attending to our emotions and we're keeping our promises and our priorities are on straight and we're using our time wisely, our spirit is flying and we're making a positive difference in the world. And that's when we attract the right people towards us and magic happens. And then you can build your field of dreams and it's coherent and it's not, there's no hierarchy in this because remember, these are just artifacts. These are the architecture is arcing energy. It's arcing and it's a different texture and competencies. It's, there's no hierarchy. It's, there's no micromanaging in this. And it's all about, we have to learn to micro our manage ourselves to self-care to know when to say yes and know when to say no and sometimes something an offer sounds good we think it's going to be physically okay it sounds good we feel pretty good about it but maybe we can't afford it so we have to say no at this point and then you just stop the decision is made or like philippe he was offered cocaine he said nope he didn't have to go through any of the other process. So it's a template that lets us know when to say yes and when to say no. And there's no such thing as never. I like to say it's, it's just about not now. Because time has changed and change is time. And this logic, why is it important? I know we're getting close on time and I just want to say a couple of things. Someone asked about the sound and how it's different. Um, Theta Mark, we're getting ready to bring out. It's the frequencies. If you've seen the movies where uh, what we call the priming frequency actually generates the Marion matrix in 10 drops of water. And it was something I predicted uh, 31 years ago and talked about a blue ball of light and even NASA. There's new information about this in the book. Um, even NASA admits this is sonoluminescence. This is sound generating energy, stable energy that can, their entropy is zero. 
Um, it, it cannot be put into chaos. The frequency that you're hearing, we've identified the exact same patterning in your brain and the exact same patterning in your heart. So what are the implications if you can put a set of headphones on and just listen to this music in your med music, it's not music, it's pure frequencies. We believe and we're getting ready. Lisa, you're going to be very happy to hear this. We've got funding to do the EEG study. So I'm Great. Talking, yeah, so I'm talking, I'm talking with docs this week. Um, imagine if you can intentionally in a three to 33 minute period, any, there's three different experiences, three and a half minutes, 11 minutes, and a 33 minute ex experience. What would it mean if you could intentionally drop into a, a theta brainwave state in no time? Okay. This pattern, like I said, is in the heart and in the brain. What are the implications of your being able to entrain the brain and the heart to cooperate? What that means is that every cell in your body is rebalancing. The implications of this are quite profound if you just stop and you think about it. The big challenge for me, um, and that blue ball of light, by the way, is plasma. And we're generating it with a brain wave frequency that you cannot even hear. The implications of that are quite significant. I'm sure you all know what plasma is. Think sun, <laughs> the sun. So not plasma in your blood. And yet you can hold it on your hand. It's, it would be ambient. So making this knowledge known to me is preparing the next generation for technology, um, for energy, a new form of energy. I call it a new clear energy source. And what if its byproduct is water? It's a game changer. It's not just a paradigm shift, it's a game changer. So knowing how to run your life how to make a positive difference, how to be in a healthy, happy, functional relationship is what this work is all about. It's about working together with others. It's understanding where you belong, where you fit, and what your role is. And I'm really fortunate to work with an amazing team. John, I know you know of Luke Kaufman's work. I mean, Luke Kaufman's one of the most brilliant people <laughs> I've ever met. And then there's you and Peter and Nick and... Pierre, we just lost Pierre Noyes, our theoretical physicist, died this year at Stanford. We've got our, one of our mathematicians, John Abson from St. Andrews, is 92. Can you believe it? But we've been working together for 30 years. So it's, it's a remarkable team. We're excited about the new book coming out. World Scientific is amazing. And um, but bringing it down to earth for earthly good. Is, is what matters for me. And right now we're working with teenagers, we're working with kids and uh, doing what we call an internship. You can see that on the website. We've got 33 kids here in the Costa del Sol um, doing an internship project, learning how to, to build their lives from inside out and then work together to, to develop a project um, as part of their senior, senior year thesis before going on to university. So I've been talking a lot, and I hope I've at least answered a few of your questions. But it's, it's a spiritual technology of mindfulness is what I think we're looking at here. And, you know, the word technology means to weave. It means to connect. It means to not. And so that's why the sound, that's what it is for me. Yeah. Well, I have found in a lot of the sort of non-ordinary kind of experiences, um, out-of-body experience and lucid dreaming, uh, I can usually tell, and, so, and I have spent some time cultivating these experiences, you know, using certain techniques, but the inner ear, I feel uh, it, it vibrates, and I can feel different vibrations in different areas of the, of, of, of the energy body, but I can always tell I'm getting ready to take off because I feel this, the inner ears are vibrating. And sometimes it sounds like a roar, uh, almost like an uh, engine of a, a, of a, a jet engine. 
And then I can feel this very gentle lifting out. It's not so much out or in, it's just like somewhere else, you know, but with a, which, but with what I would call transphysical senses are heightened and they, and they are related to the physical senses. I believe there's a tremendous overlap between these transphysical and physical. And uh, I, I don't see it as an either or, but as much more on a continuum. And, and I believe that I think what would the uh, human centered futures be like um, using technology in ways that uh, support our, uh, the best that we have to offer one another. Uh, I think we would be these, um, we would be making these uh, connections um, between these, uh, between the subtle and the very subtle and the physical. And it would be much more fluid than it is now. Right now, we're sort of clunky. We either are in this world, the physical world, which we mistake for the waking world. You right. know, the waking world is not the physical world. <laughs> and I think uh, in, in the dream space, it's, uh, sometimes we have great ones or we have bad ones. But when we wake up in the physical waking world, we say, wow, I'm glad, you know, that was a wild dream. But I think there's something else in the in-between these, uh, some people call it those, those liminal zones, where if there are enough people who were more tuned, more attuned to the, these different shifts, uh, we could tune into things, I think, in, like remote viewers, uh, like the CIA was working with remote viewers. Uh, this was spies es doing espionage. Um, but there's also been the use of the same way in, in psycho, uh, what do they call it? Uh, They've been they've excavated sites, archaeological digs, by having certain people who are good at remote viewing who say, "Oh, start the digging over there." You know, I can see it. It's about uh, you know a few feet under the, about five feet down, at, right at that area. That's where the the top of the wall of this ancient city is. And I I think that's a really fascinating use of these uh, innate capacities, which you know our factory model education has suppressed. But I think the human futures that may be uh, available to us and the technologies that would be frozen for you too. Yeah, yeah. it's frozen for me. Oh no. Frozen for all of us. He's gone now. <laughs> He'll come back. Yeah, he's not gone. <laughs> he's not gone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you disappeared, John. You froze, John. We yeah. missed the punchline. He's gone again. <laughs> so where was he going with that, though? He was. Well, he's. You know what was interesting to me was, um, I don't know if he. We're we're recording this, right? So he'll yes. be able to pick up my comments. We'll yes. we'll just keep going. Mm -hmm. Was in his his experience with the ears? Because for years I said there's a missing pulse, um, an electromagnetic system in the body, and it turned out to be the ears and the ears you actually one of your there's you know the hairs inside your ear do you know that they actually grow they expand and they contract and it's based on a golden ratio and one is receiving and one is returning so there's this pulsing that goes on with the with the ears if we were together i could show you something i'm sorry we're not because it would be a whole lot of fun but what we're saying is there's an intelligence and i call it an intelligence and it's very different from an intelligent what we what we think of someone being intelligent and these inner awarenesses these inner knowings and john's correct it gets roto rooted out of kids by the time they get to school <coughs> it's i flunked art in kindergarten for making purple sky and I flunked math for coloring outside the lines of a quarter inch little tiny boxes that I was supposed to color with a crayon that was as thick as my finger and I couldn't so I just said screw it and colored made my own picture and got in trouble for it so we're not we're not allowed to pay attention teachers educators have forgotten that the root of educari is not it's to call forth that which is authentic from within us what do you hear what do you feel what do you what do you see oh you see something five feet under the ground it's let's go see if we can find it 
we ignore that. And instead we cram in, we sh then slap the brain shut, shake them up and give them a test and make them dump it out exactly the way we said it's supposed to be. And if you say anything other than the answer that's, that they want, you're gonna be wrong. So I think Marcos, what, what, what John is talking about is there's different ways of knowing, there's different ways of being. If I look at this person, the know-it-all, what we call the queen bee, the person who is attending to all the priorities in the system as compared to this person who's connecting all the dots, you know, managing the numbers, this is guy's in the flow and this guy's in the, the points. Very different energy. This guy sits at a desk and punches numbers. This person has a flag and hangs out at the water cooler or on the couch. So because they're different skill sets, they're just different abilities to be. And then there's visionaries like me and being a visionary, man, it's the loneliest job in the world. But I wouldn't choose any other job. It's, but it, boy, it's not easy. But it's an adventure, <laughs> and it's and, and and my job, my challenge with this work is how do you bring all this down to earth for earthly good? Because it has to matter, it has to count. And you know, Nathan Kutin told me, 1994. Wow, time flies. He said this. This will be the only light shining when the lights go out. And it's looking pretty dim right now. And so I think it's just very important that all of us, that it's our inner light that has to be shining. People who see you, people who are drawn to you, people who are attracted to the work that you're doing. All I'm trying to do, <laughs> someone very wise person called this the logic of love. And it's just, it's knowing when to say yes and knowing when to say not no. And it's about measurability and meaningfulness. And it's the link. It's how you connect those two in that seamless, continuous flow. Because when you're lucid dreaming, John, I go into that place when I'm writing. I start writing about eight or nine o'clock in the morning and I don't know what happens when I look up. I've had my cup of coffee, but it's three o'clock in the afternoon. And I'm just, I'm just writing. Or if I'm painting, which I haven't had the time to do, that, that too happens. But that's why doing what you love to do, not what someone else wants you to do, doing what you want to do because you love it, because you're passionate about it, not because someone else expects it of you or wants it for you. That's, that's the seamless, that's the timelessness, that's the, you know, spirituality coming down to life, coming down into the, into the physical realm where we can be both and physical and spiritual. That's part of the paradox, bridging the paradox in a seamless, timeless way. Ed, you've got this big question on your face, and we both keep doing that. <laughs> well, allow me to ask the question, but you don't have to answer it. Okay. I don't get how you get from the not to the forms. They're the same. I don't. I don't. I don't I, I'm trying. I, I've. I read the front matter in the first three chapters of the book, and. And I understand fully what you're what you're saying. I, I couldn't agree with it more. Um, in many many regards, it's to me the most self understood and obvious thing that I've heard in a long time. But I don't get. I, and let me ask a subsidiary or an auxiliary question as well. Do you actually, with your the children that you work with in the education fund, do you talk to them about the geometrical forms, or do you just let them go with the roles? Okay. Just the roles and responsibilities. That's, okay, Here's which I, I, I would guess. That, that's what I would think. But I've got but, to show you, and in the book, you have to find the pictures, because we asked five-year-olds to paint a picture of the game they play at school. 
and yeah. we've never shown them geometry. We never talk yeah, about geometry. Yeah, I, I, that, that's, that, I, I get that but, part. But guess what they drew? I, I would guess what they would draw. Would draw but Amazing. I am the kind of person who wants to know, well, how do you get there? Right. How do you get from that three tray foil knot to a tetrahedron? How do you get there? Yeah. That, okay. That's what I, that's the link I'm missing right now. Good. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's actually, it's one of my favorite answers, questions to answer, because it's so Good. simple. Good. Well, I'm a simple person. That's why I <laughs> ask simple questions. No, he's not. <laughs> Geometry. <laughs> okay. Ed, this is for you. Come Say something so you come back on my screen. Because I'm going to. Okay. Look. I'm here. All right. Okay. Right. Now I can see you. Good. Okay. Good. Because the last person I'll talked I'll keep to murmuring if it helps. <laughs> <on my screen. laughs> okay. Murmur, murmur, murmur. Okay. Geometry, we can count. One, two, three, four. Okay? One, two, three, four. Faces. Or we can count one, two, three, four, five, six. Edges. Okay? Because this is a thing. Okay? But what happens... I mean, now I'm going to move from this to my finger and my elbow. Mm -hmm. It's a line. Yeah. It's a point. Okay? It's a line. But when it moves, what is it doing? Is well, it I see it creating another dimension there. No, I'm, what am I creating? What is it doing? A circle. An it's arc. A circle to me. It's defining Perhaps an it's arc. It's an defining arc. an arc. Yeah. I cannot make a complete circle with my arm like this. No. Doing an arm. No, no. But if I take my hand and I point my thumb, I can do this and I can do two circles. So I've created a spiral. I've created a right-handed spiral. It's actually what your DNA is doing. You know this, okay? So this is a climb bottle. This is Lisa's climb bottle. And if I do it with my other hand, I get a left-hand spiral. It's a Philippine so wine dance. relationship between the form and the geometry, here's, the, here's one thing that you may have missed, John, is there's not only one knot in the Marian matrix. There's five. There are five interacting knots. Now, here's what I think is a big deal and why... John, your lucid dreaming is so important, the encounters that we have, the spiritual realms, realities, and remnants is, I met Stephen Hawking. It's one of the great joys of my life was getting to spend serious time with Stephen Hawking at Oxford. And any of you see his book called The Universe in a Nutshell? I don't know look it up. Universe in a nutshell. Look at page 33. Because he wrote this book after we met. And I introduced him to the pattern, the knot, the geometry. And page 33 of the universe in a nutshell, he shows the trefoil knot inflated, because he didn't understand the expansion of the from the lower dimensional trefoil to the to the polarized trefoil knot, the Marian matrix. And he says, this is the only candidate. It's symmetrical. It's asymmetrical with perfect symmetry. Oh, Lisa. That's not his book, is it? No, that's, is that hard? Say something, book? say something, Lisa, so we can- Oh, my mother, she's showing you his book. <laughs> Go to page 33. That's the that book, universe in a nutshell. Yeah, that's page 33. And there's the knot, which Stephen Hawking says, it's symmetrical, it's a with perfect symmetry, and that knot is the only candidate for time. Are those choo-choo trains on the knot? Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's like living on the knot, <laughs> living on the knot, traveling through time. And in our book, we say very clearly that we are traveling through the knot of time. And there are intersections. There are four intersections from two directions, front and back. The five knots are interconnected. So 
Is time travel possible? Absolutely. Where do you go in your lucid dreaming? You are traveling through time. You just have to, you are in a knot of time where you're able to pop back in to your body in this lifetime. But if you have guards or guardians or guides from other dimensions, where are they coming from? They're coming from perhaps a different layer in space or a different track of time. Right. And this is because the space of the, of the geometry, the context, the bubble. Ed, can you think of that, the whole system? Mm -hmm. We define yeah. the four. There's three elements in the Marian matrix. There's the core, the nucleus, its context, which is a boundary, and the connection between the two. And the knot is actually the interaction between the core and the context. And the core is carbon. The context is water, salt water. And so you have, you have electricity. You have a piezoelectric effect going on because you've got carbon and water. And you've got salt. So you've got, you've got all this interaction going on. And the knot is actually the language between what we call the masculine principle, the core, which seeds the system energetically from inside, and the context, the boundary, the bubble. In 19, no, in 2004, Lou Kaufman and I were, I think we were at SUNY Potsdam. When Kazim Madhavi, a mathematician, um, we presented to a group of about 50 mathematicians and physicists, and at the end of a two-hour talk, it was Bob Gray as well, at the end of this very long talk in this full room, there was total silence. And the first person to speak was Kazim Madhavi, who stood up and he said, I have one problem, and then I want to say something, but I want to address my problem first. He says, he said, you keep referring to the Marian matrix as it. From this day forward, I request that from now on, the Marian matrix be referred to as her. Because where we are encountering this system, this knowledge, is as observers. We are looking at it. We are entering into it. And he said, "That's a fem we're observing her breathe and birth. Those are feminine principles. The core, the carbons, the carbon structure, which is dynamic as well, is seeding the energy from the inside. That is the masculine principle. And the pattern, the knot, is the pattern that connects them. It's the pattern of patterns. The knot Lisa showed you is the trefoil knot. It's the simplest knot. It's just you take a shoe, a shoelace or a belt and put one overhand loop in it and butt the ends together and you've got that trefoil knot. But the Marian knot goes through a very complex transformation to open up into this geospherical knot that has a north and south and east and west meet and greet and pass through each other like this. But north I haven't and read the whole book. Do you describe that in, in the book? We do. We do. And we actually show pictures of how that happens. Okay. That's, yeah, that's, we do. That, that's, what, that, that's where I'm having difficulty following you okay the, I, I mean the forms are all nice and I, I, yeah. I think that's wonderful and to be able to, to, to demonstrate and give me a visual along with that but I, it's not clear to me how you get from this one to that one right yes. right exactly okay okay so I find that and you know what I'll do is there will I will also um, if you go to Bob to Bob Gray our www let me see if I can enter this in the chat. Maybe I can enter it in the chat. Good. This is Bob Gray, the artist yes. who created the illustrations. WWR Gray. Okay, projects.com. Then go to how the universe works. Okay, under uh, rwgrayprojects.com, you'll find a section called How the Universe Works. Every mm -hmm. single, we've hid everything in there. Um, you know, I'll tell you right now, my dad was CIA. Uh, Jim Channon, if you saw Men Who Stare at Goats, which was just a crying shame, they, they ruined 
an amazing story. Jim Channon was one of my best friends. He died in November. Um, Lisa and I spent lots of time looking at Jimmy videos while she was here. But um, how the universe works, everything in that section is about this work because we, we literally have never laid it out in any way that anybody but us could understand. But go to how the universe works and then scroll down until you find me. And when you find me, there's um, a presentation there that it's, I think it's the very first one, and it's Tucson, 2007. Mm -hmm. Look at that and go, you can fast forward to page six, which is going to show you the whole system in motion, and it will blow your mind. Okay. Because you can see the geometry in motion, and you can actually slow it down. I think you can slow it down enough so you can almost like see the click stops where you can see the, you will see the expansion, the contraction, the spinning, the rotating, and it will give you a, it will give you a feeling. Don't try to figure it out with your brain, but it will give you a feeling. And then if you look back at the old cover um, or just scroll through those pages in Bob's, most people don't even know those are there. Yep. It's it's a huge archive, and um, I'll look and see if there's some things I can unblind for you because there's a whole lot more that's not even on the website. Okay, that that'd be really good. I I spent a lot of time um, frame clicking through the things on the Marion Matrix website. Right, but that's but, but everything everything's already there. We don't. Yeah, we don't. You know what's on the yeah. Marion.org website is is the link to the thousand page book that's coming out. Exactly, that's the only one I was able to look at and everything's there already. And I am going like, okay, well, how do you get from the not there? Yeah, yeah there's, there's a lot of stuff there. Okay. Yeah, right. there's the resources are already oh, up there. And that, they're that's very helpful. That's very helpful, thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, so th that's there, but go to Bob's site because then you get more words with that. You'll get a lot more words. Right. But it's, um, yeah, but the work, you know, we're getting ready for the future. I mean, we're in the future. We are the future. Yeah. And uh, preparing, preparing for what's to come because it's not very pretty right now. And there's, yeah. you know, there's no room in love. And to me, my experience, I came away, my number one word wasn't love. It was music. And music to me is harmony. Oh, Lisa, you've got the knot. Too bad we're not there and we can't breathe it and show them how it yeah. works. Lisa has the knot. She just froze. Um, oh, there you yeah, go. I don't know. If there I, go. There's a way to. Yeah, there's a way. To, you can't do it, Lisa. Yeah, don't don't try. You'll just mess it up. Okay. It takes two people. There's turn it, rotate it 90 degrees, Lisa. Keep north and south. You've got north and south. Yeah. So if you can see the loons, she's holding on to one. Now she's holding on to two. And opposite, you can see two more. And if I was there holding the two that are on this side, I could literally push them through Lisa's and hers would come around me. And what's amazing, what's because, and you, north and south have stayed fixed. So it's like east and west are meeting, kissing, and greeting as they pass through one another. But if we were to put a mark on the top where north and south are, they change. <laughs> it's mind-bending, but it's really beautiful. Yeah, I, I asked Lynn Claire years ago about, you know, how do you get – Where's the paradox in this? Where's, you know, I, I think in terms of Klein bottles. And when she showed me that transformation of like basically pushing it, it through itself, that's when my aha went off of that's the, the both and in, in this structure. And in that process, as it's passing through itself, what happens is it goes from you immediately see three lines, Lisa, compress it. Just take east and west, north and south, and just compress it. Yeah, there. So there, see the three lines? So you see three lines. Now rotate it 90 degrees. And you see a circle. And then it opens up into this 
three-dimensional knot. So it's, you're going from what looks, it's all about perspective. It's all about the illusion. John, this is the illusion from the dreaming to the waking and thinking. Right. That, right. That you're not going like, anywhere. That's my feeling. It, yeah. it, it's a phase space. It's and all phase changing. Exactly. Absolutely. It's a continuum. There is no stopping. It's like people say, well, what happened to you when you died? And I go, you know what? I, my body slowed down and stopped so my consciousness could accelerate and finally see where I am. And, and Ralph Abraham, uh, father of chaos theory, Lou, all of these guys, none of Russ Tarr, Jim Channon, the miracle of all this is, I mean, these guys were doing near-death experiences. If any of you have ever seen Flatliners, you know that's what they were doing. They were inducing near-death experiences and trying to find the heart of creation. They were trying to remember, and they never thought, <laughs> they never thought I'd be able to remember all the detail. And my, you know, I've spent the last 31 years saying, prove I'm wrong. And the challenge to Bob Gray, and I'm it's still happening. I'm, we're not done. You know, this is an unfolding. That's what. That's why I'm safe. Jim Channon couldn't believe I'm still alive, but it's. It, I haven't been wrong. It's not about a need to be right. You know, need to be right or need to be in control are the two things that'll kill a relationship. But being correct. You know, every time I have to talk to Bob or Lou, I go with shaking boots because I go, maybe it's time for me to quit, but here's a new piece of information. We need to, you know, please disprove it. Then I can go home because <laughs> I'm persuaded this is hell. We're living in this big illusion. We've, you know, I think we're a penal colony. I think we're here no. <laughs> to remember. No argument from this yeah. side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're running the asylum yeah you talk about being a visionary and being a visionary how do you live with people who are not visionaries it's a big challenge to live compassionately and open-heartedly with people who are not there yet yeah and um i think that's a i think if everything's going fine don't don't, there's no need to fix it, but if things are breaking down, that's when visionaries often come forward and they have to articulate their vision in a way that they can share it. So I think, but was you, you, you seem to be, what I'm taking away from this conversation is that the inner worlds are objective. There's an objectivity there. We're so used to in our culture to think of the inner worlds as subjective and private. And they're not private. They're very public. <laughs> There's they're a lot going on there. Exactly. <laughs> there are and entities who are, who are well meant, who are well intentioned, and there are entities that are not well intentioned. Absolutely. And we have to deal with Absolutely. That. It's like there are people who are channeling energy. Okay. And guess what? The minute I walk into a room, most of them will shut up. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Because I'll ask them where they come from because. Most people who are channeling entities, they are coming. I will tell you right now, there's we, this universe that we're living in has 33 floors, and we are on the 32nd floor, and we are transitioning to the 33rd floor. My guides, my guardians come from the 33rd floor, a different space and time. And this is a little out there, but I'm going there with you, John. This is <laughs> okay? Thank now, you. There are there are other folks who live on the 31st floor, and it's a big floor. It's a big level. It's more than double the size of where we are. And they're going to be the next bozos on the bus because we are moving through time. A lot of scientists think we're about to go through a pole flip. I'm going, nope, we're not there yet. We have one more, one more cycle to go. But when people are getting your attention – and snagging your attention and focusing you on something up or outside of yourself, they're not focusing you on the right thing. And that's why it's so critical that we start with the me, that we start with the individual and build ourselves, understand ourselves from the inside out, because that's the only way we can come together and trust. 
trust. Without trust, there is no such thing as a real relationship. It's not true. It's not. Trust is truth. And you have to recognize it. It has that resonance. And if your bullshit detector is not working, you're just going to be in big trouble. And it's not going to be a pretty picture. And I tell you what, I'm having a hard time with the news. I'm have, I, but you know what? I'm here to make a positive difference in the lives of every person I touch. And we live on planet Earth. This is my assignment. Right. It's your assignment. It's why you're in a body. Right. But you're here to remember. And the challenge is to experience and appropriately express whatever we're feeling right here, right now. Because then we don't have to carry it as baggage with us. And helping these kids prepare, I think we're going to see this shift. Um, I'd say get ready. I'd say be prepared. Know where your family is. Know where your safe centers are. But be ready. But be willing to stand up and speak up. And, and trust what you know. Know what You know, hear what you hear. Feel what you feel. Know what you know. Nothing will stop you. So, yeah, being a visionary, it's like, oh. I mean, I never thought I'd leave the monastery. So I, I go from a monastic existence to being really, really homesick. Would it, would you have a little more time? Would it be okay to back up a little bit and um, connect a couple of dots? Please. Okay. Stepping right into this mode. <laughs> well, I spent some time with the website, with the paper. Uh, I didn't make it to your web, your personal website, linclair.love, I think it is. No, 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 that's turned off. Gone. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, I didn't so, want it. <laughs> okay, so, so I, I, I got um, a sketch of your story. Uh, you've mentioned your near-death experiences. And from the video, I learned that in those experiences, you saw the, the matrix. You saw what you've come to call or has come to be called the Marian matrix. And since that time, if, if I'm understanding correctly, you've been in a process of translating or articulating that perception uh, into terms that others could understand and not just understand, but see themselves, hear themselves. This is why the website says making the invisible visible and the inaudible audible. Uh, and so what it seems to me like is what you are working with are these forms, right? Forms and dynamics which pertain to elements like light, sound, et cetera, but they're not just, just physical. They're not external in the same way that rationalistic science would, you know, see these structures out there. They're, they're part of us. They're constitutive, we could say. And so part of your quest, part of the, the work you've been doing in, in, with mathematicians uh, physicists and, you know, and, and others who really are equipped to validate your, your, your claims. Uh, part of that work has been to um, translate from the visionary experience, from the visionary perception into uh, not just kind of theoretically relatable forms, but practically applicable uh, forms. And so this brings you know, us to the work in education and in demonstrating how a holistic, dynamic um, kind of, I'm thinking about it as almost a nanotechnology. It's like a social nanotechnology or a psychic nanotechnology because you're, you're going to the fundamental shapes that experiences kind of come in, the packets of experience, and reconfiguring those in a way that is consonant with a that vision of of interconnected, living, intelligent wholeness, which is in that shape of the Marian matrix, and you could decompose it into its constitutive forms all the way down to the point. Uh, now, there's one point in your video, which I thought was interesting, and I didn't know how to, I, I, I found it very poetic, actually. 
Um, and it's where you are looking at the matrix and where there's a sense that it disappears into or kind of dissolves into nothing. And I wonder, well, I wanted to uh, presence that, uh, mention it, and maybe feel further into uh, really what that journey has been that has this glorious form and this, you know, these vast points uh, that are being woven together at the same time that the nothing that that sense of void uh is is kind of underneath it all or within it all The nothingness and the not thing. It's the pattern. Gregory Bateson talked about the pattern that connects is the pattern of patterns. And this not because of water and sparking energy. It's water and light. So when you have water and you have light and you have space, what you get is a rainbow. So I'd ask you, is a rainbow real? Real enough for me. (laughs) Is a rainbow true? It's true for me. (laughs) Is a rainbow a thing? So it's ambiguous for me. I would say it's ambiguous. Is real. A rainbow is true, but it is not a thing. It is evidence of two things in space and time. So the journey that I've been on for 31 years, I'll tell you very truthfully that if If I had known it would take, I agreed to everything. But if I had known it would take 31 years, I wouldn't have done it. (laughs) I, I don't think I would have had the courage. So embracing Embracing nothing, being embraced by no thingness, and yet knowing it is the only thing that is real and the only thing that is true. And living in a world where we are constantly wounded by what I call relation snips and relationship and relationship it's time to heal 
And so I would say I've been on a 31 year journey of stillness knowing that I'm nothing. <laughs> why me? The answer, the only obvious answer is why not? The universe knew I was too stubborn to ever shut up if I ever remembered. <laughs> and, um, you know, I lost all my memory in the accident. For me, I don't know the answer why. The only thing I know is how. I know that it's like we talk about Humpty Dumpty once you can't ever put it back together again. But what I know is that every mother knows how to put her child back together again. And I think that's why our whole team calls Mary and mom. And if you flip it upside down, it's wow. And so every day, Marco, I put myself back together again. Realizing it's not about one person. Heaven knows it's not about me. I got an email, Lisa knows about this, it was maybe four or five months ago. Someone sent it through the website telling me I had failed, that if they had gotten the job, it would be known by now. And I couldn't, couldn't respond, they did it anonymously. My answer to other people about, you know, what I would have said to that person is, I wish you'd gotten the job too. But, um, can, can I jump in here with a, a, a bit of lightness? Please. Um, so, when I was in Spain there with Lynn Claire, she took me down the street to this um, structure that we thought was an old uh, mosque built by the king of Saudi Arabia, the recently deceased king of Saudi Arabia. Um, and uh, it turns out it wasn't a mosque, it was a bank, but, you know, anyhow. It, it had a very beautiful geometric shape. And it just seemed like the perfect place for a, a learning center, um, a center where people could, are you okay? There was just a big accident up front. Let me, I'll ignore it. Yeah. I live on the main street here in Marbella and there was just a big accident. You didn't hear it? Ooh. Send energy. Okay. Um, anyhow, I, I've, I can still envision this place as, um, uh, a multi-purpose, you know, train the trainers. This is where teachers can come to learn, um, how to bring this to their educational process. It can also be a place for, um, uh, people who are interested in taking this work further to come together and, and have conferences and bring their own insight and energy into developing the, the work. So, you know, both, both bringing people in and sending the work out wider. And, and I see, I see that place as, having, um, you know, uh, bringing it out of, out of the, you know, the ethers of, of the internet to an actual physical place that we can come together and, and explore 
more about Marion. Um, I'm, I'm hoping you'll give me good news from Fernando, but anyhow, I just wanted to put that out there to this group too, that, you know, it's, it's time for this work to, to go beyond Lynn Clare and, and her immediate team. Absolutely. You know, a system is a system is a system. It doesn't matter if it's you, a family, a relationship, a business, a government. The rules of a living system apply to every lifelike system because we're living systems, but a family, two people in relationship, a company, those are living systems, lifelike systems. They obey the same rules because they're made up of people. So if you have... You know, if this is a if this is a universal model as we are asserting, we are suggesting, we are positing, we are theorizing, we are applying it, we are showing you how to do it. You know, you have to know. It's I, Marco. You didn't say reductionistic science, but you know, people say, "Are you a reductionist or a holist?" I'm going, yes. <laughs> You know, if you know how to put all the pieces back together again, that's the beautiful thing about this matrix. If, if you break it, guess what? You can only put it back together again one way. It can only, you can, it will put itself back together again. It's self-organizing. So if you have someone who's teaching business courses or teachers who are teaching school, like Lisa was talking about, or doctors who are training, whatever their vision is, visionaries, they're lonely. And visionaries, the worst of the lot, you know, they're, they're the know-it-alls, they're the ultimate micromanagers. They don't want to delegate. They don't want to turn something over. They don't know how to trust other people. But a true visionary has to learn that a vision evolves. You know, and the beautiful thing about this, the Marion matrix, and by the way, I'll tell you right now, Marion is not a name. It is a naming. It is a mathematical formula. If you think about E equals MC squared, M equals E, blah, 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 just back it all up. And we didn't disclose it in the book, but I think I'll, I'll be putting it out in the next newsletter. We've decided just to let it go. It's really beautiful. It's very, very simple. And the O is not an O, it's a golden, it's a symbol for the golden ratio. The second E is backwards, it's Euler's E, and the N is infinite. <laughs> it goes on forever. So it's a naming, it's not a name. Um, but it's, it's any visionary, nobody, nobody is going to be able to tell my story. This is my story all these little bits and pieces that make my story, my life, my physical life, my emotional story, the story of my journey, how I've managed to stay alive for 31 years, what my priorities and my promises over time in my spirit, what my soul has been here to do and has done isn't anybody else's story. But you know what? If you were here, I would feed you. There would be food on the table. We would all eat, we would all drink, we would all laugh and lighten up, we would pass the talking stick, we would have a great time, and when our meal was digested and when it was all full, we'd line up for one of the loos. <laughs> because what goes in, what goes through, will come out, okay? And it doesn't matter if it's piss or shit, it's gonna come out. And there will be a lineup. So none of us are dying of terminal uniqueness. So what we have is we have a method where people can take, here's the tools that they've developed. Here's their little bits, their little sparks that they have. And here's what they've built. And here's how they feel about it. And here's what they think about it. And here's what their promise is and why it's important and why the priorities are there. And and why the time and the time and timing and all of those elements, how you deal with risk, how you deal with quality control, and then the spiritual, whether it's spiritual, whether it's, you know, call it new age, call it religious, or call it ethics and morality. What they put out, what they take in is what they put out into the world. So 
All we have is a delivery system for a coherent, clear, it's a method. It's a process. It's sequential. If you skip one step, if you eat and you take in food and you don't drink any water, what happens? Constipation. The shit backs up. <laughs> and you've got a real problem. So nothing goes through. Or what happens if you take in something that's rotten, you throw it up. It doesn't go through. Or if you take in something that's rotten and, and then you drink bad water after it, your brain says, oh, we've got a problem, Houston. And the priority is to find the bathroom because it's going to come out the other end. So a system is a system is a system. So all we have is an understanding of why and how. And so it's up to us to determine what's the next. Next is my favorite word because it means I've finished something. But it's like Lisa said, yeah, we have, there's a group, we have a vision for expanding it. Um, we're about to release the sound product, the meditational tool, which I think is very powerful. John, I, I think you'd need to tie, tie golden, golden strands on both your big toes and tie yourself to the bedpost. <laughs> but it's, um, you know, it's time, it's time to make that which has been unknown known right. and, and to demystify the mysteries and to stop shaming and blaming and judging. Um, just be, it's like what Marco so beautifully pointed out, you know, we're making the golden ratio, by the way, these inaudible frequencies, this it's the number is just unbelievable and Lisa can tell you there's a huge connection to these ancient temples in particular the hypogeum in Malta and others about the frequencies they resonate to that have an impact on the brain that what do they do Lisa they disconnect the language center they stop the, this frequency literally stops the brain's ability to recognize pattern what does that do that throws you into the right side of your brain that throws you into the creativity, the creative space that, that Mark, who I see is now gone, that that's what he was focusing on with his creative writing, with his novels. So to be able to go into that space at will and then to come out of it and step into that alpha and then into that beta state to be able to accomplish and do what needs to be done is, is powerful. That's what I'm up to. Have we been talking for, have I been talking for two hours? <laughs> Almost. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lynn Claire. I've, I've really learned a lot today. Thank you so much. Oh, it's been I'm great. looking forward to, to rereading this chapter and more chapters in the book. I think I'll absorb it, the, the nutrients, uh, much better from after having this, uh, dialogue with you today great that really helps any other questions well if you were inviting us over for dinner uh, <laughs> especially with the nice bottle of spanish wine lisa knows the way <laughs> i'm the visionary with an open house <laughs> and a great cook <laughs> thank you it's true <laughs> thank you so much oh thank you, really. Listen, anything, anytime, be fun to talk. It's pass it on. It's, you know, getting this, getting this work out there. So anything we can do to spread this word, I think it's critical. I, I know it's critical. I don't just think it is. I, I know it is. And, and it's time. Take a look at the project that we're doing here in Spain. We're, we're pretty excited about it. We're very excited about it. It's called Internship. But TURN is spelled T-U-R-N kids in international baccalaureate schools to get into the top schools. When they graduate their senior year, they have to do an internship. And a father came to me and said, will you do an internship for my son? And can he do an internship with you and your team? And I said, sure. And so they came over and we turned all these huge windows looking out at the sea into whiteboards 
and I walked him through this whole process. And then he sat down and he said, I'm a thousand percent in, but, but this can't be just for me. How many of my friends can come? So that's pretty cool. You know, one thing I'd like to add before we close is Please. that um, I think that it's, it's been uh, felicitous that you've been here today uh, because in a way, kind of like the way you put your models together, you're offering a piece that maybe this group, you know, doesn't specifically have, but we may also have some aspects that, that you don't have. Absolutely. Um, in particular, I'm thinking about this way in which um, part of what we've been cultivating here has been more of a comparative uh, type of methodology where we're looking at diverse models, uh, diverse um, pictures like of how reality is put together, uh, you know, what the various processes, forms, and, and dynamics are. And so as I have been learning about the Marian matrix, uh, in my part, part of what's been, part of what I've been experiencing are these resonances or um, connections with other things we've discussed, or other things I've read. I could see things from, for example, um, Jean Gebser in this work or from uh, the, uh, the, the um, Mary research uh, mm -hmm. that, that we did a, a session on with, with Ed a few months ago. What was that again? Meru, M-E-R-U. Oh, Stan's a good poem. I know Stan yeah. well. Okay, yeah. well. Yeah. well oh, I mean, wow. part, so do I. Yeah. <laughs> part of what <laughs> we've been work. doing in the cafe has been... Um, I've known it for 25 years. <laughs> that, that makes perfect sense. Um, <laughs> but it's given, I think, part of what we've been doing is, is comparing, contrasting, seeing... The apple in my hand. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's it's I think given us some perspective or some meta perspectives on you know how different models work, where they fit together, where maybe they differ, um, and you know it's been a journey I think for all of us to take in so much information uh, <laughs> and uh, so much complexity uh, because it certainly is that, and you know we're not just talking one particular domain of. Uh, you know, of inquiry, we're, you know, we're, we're jumping. We're between. talking everything. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and so it can be, um, I know one thing I notice is that translations between discourses could become kind of awkward uh, because one person is speaking in the language of, you know, this particular theory, another person is speaking in another language. And, and then there are theorists who explicitly try to correlate between, you know, different theories. So they're kind of like meta theories. But then there's this whole other dimension to it, which is the artistic and the creative and the performative, where we're not just lining up theories and making them make sense in some kind of objective system, but we're performing something, we're enacting something, transforming something, creating something, co-creating. And th this is where I feel that what you've introduced gives these almost like um, building blocks, like Legos or something, uh, to play with. And to, you know, even say, well, what happens if we take this little dodecahedron here and combine it with this evolutionary, you know, meta theory here? And what, what happens next? Um, that curiosity is part of what motivates me. It's part of what makes it exciting and interesting to, to do this kind of thing. And I'm really glad to hear as well about the, the, the physical incarnation spaces, uh, because so much, you know, is, is not transmitted uh, through our current electronic digital means. Certain things only happen in, in intimate spaces. Uh, it's great to be interconnected at the same time across vast distances. So there really can be these hybrid sort of uh, flows. And uh, I feel that you've kind of given us some, some, something to metabolize and something to uh, mm -hmm. to take in and to put out. And uh, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Well, I think you'll find our book that we did just the opposite of what you've said, where we've, <laughs> taken, where we've taken Nick Wolf from NASA and I took, we started with the Big Bang and took it all the way up to you, human, clinical, molecular genetics. 
How did we get from, we used the matrix to go from there, from nothing, from stardust to you. And then you took it and went from human clinical molecular genetics to a baby being born. Okay. So it's, it's a, it's a brilliant idea. It's a brilliant process. And that's what it's all about. It's called dialogue and dialogue is two or more and what connects us and is the realization that we're both teachers and students and it's all about cultivating perspective. That's the magic. This has been fun guys, gals, you, <laughs> Lise. <laughs> so. Right. Well, yeah. we, we, I'm sure, uh, I, you know about our forum. We often um, write to one another impressions or things that, you know, popped up after the interview. So uh, I'm hope here. You'll join us there. <laughs> I'm here. I'm on it. I get your messages. Mm -hmm. So, because I have a lot of ideas that I haven't articulated yet. So maybe in the forum, I can step forward and pursue. Processing. I I like to say it's time to end process, and we have a progression, an understanding of progression that leads to true progress. And right. so that's what dialogue is all about. So yeah, I'm here. I'll play. <laughs> what I feel like you've modeled for me is I, I feel like the affective and the cognitive are in flow. And uh, I really very much appreciate that because I know um, sometimes I get a little overheated, <laughs> you know, but I think that, that cool head and the warm, that cool head and the warm heart is the optimum, uh, the best state to be in in order to communicate especially the unusual or the uncanny. So uh, I think you've done a great job. So thank you very much for sharing all this. Well, I can tell you that I was invited to come and present this model to Davos. I had a member of the Davos World Economic Forum came and spent two days with me and we did global economics. And you know what he said? It's flawless, but wow. the world will have to fall apart before the world will ever live this way. I, I think, think it is falling apart. I think we're on the cusp of that. Yeah. So to have to have a big economics guy from a Swiss, no doubt, no less, say that this is a flawless system for an economic model, you know, is worth it's worth taking a look at because I had the head of NASA challenge me. <laughs> I'll dig it out and send it and post it. He challenged me. He said. I don't think you can explain everything through this model. And you know what someone's telling you when they throw that gauntlet down? They're saying, I've got something you can't do. <laughs> and he was begging me to stop for the next 20 minutes. <laughs> you can't take the bait on those kinds of questions. <laughs> <laughs> I love taking the bait. <laughs> Especially when they don't see that the hook Sure <laughs> yeah, where the hook's in place. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. guys. All right. Over and out. Thank <laughs> you. Adios. Thank you very, very much. Appreciate it. Hey, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I look forward to I'd love to do it again. All right. We will. About anything. I, I'm actually a very good fly on the wall. Believe it or not, I'm an introvert. <laughs> I, know. I love your we art, all? by the way. I was looking at some, of your, some of your pictures. Some of your your paintings are exquisite. Um, oh, thank oh, yeah. you. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, thank just, you. Just, there's, I, 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 I commented on the forum. I realized we're only, we've only scratched the surface. There's so much mm -hmm. more. And so I would encourage, let's, you know, let's share more art. <laughs> Let, mm -hmm. Let's oh, share yeah. more music. The connect, the music, the, the language that binds. That That's... Um, one of the things. Well, let's do another. I will. Let's do another session, and let's start it with silence. Mm -hmm. And let's start it with an eleven-minute meditation. All right, we'll do that too. Well, sounds, you in the deep end. sounds good to me. All right, schedule it. I'll come back. Okay. All right. Good. And then we'll. Then we'll. But we'll. But we have to do it from the we. That's doing it from the we yeah. perspective. We start, we put ourselves into the global mm -hmm. deep end, okay. through the sound. And then we come back and we talk about the vision. So what came up for you? What came up for you? What came up? Mm -hmm. What arose? What was emergent in that process? No judgment, no evaluation. 
And when everyone's spoken, then, then you can talk about time. Mm -hmm. Then you can get into the me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Lots of things are emerging for me already. So mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to that. Fun. Okay, guys. All right. I love Bye. you all. Lisa, I miss hey. you. Okay. Bye, Bye Lisa. Bye. Welcome back, Lisa. Okay. Good to see you Thank again. You. Bye.